afternoon. This is uh, CIVE 632, and today is November 10th, uh, 2021. And this is, uh, let me see, this is the second class of the 12th week. We have uh, four more weeks to go on the semester, like till the end of December or middle of December. Uh, the subject today is more on numerical numerical mathematics or numerical modeling. And um, so what I'm going to do now, we're going to look at a couple of papers and I'm going to do what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, share the screen. I believe so that was part two. Let me see. Okay, I got it. Okay, does everybody see the the syllabus there? Yes. Okay, so we got O'Brien, a study of numerical solutions, unconditional stability, convergence of four point implicit waterway models. Convergence of four point implicit waterway models. Okay. And uh, to get started here, I should tell you that uh, you have heard Professor Pons talk about Danny Frank. Um, I've met Danny two or three times at the conferences. You know, I, I used to go to the conference and he was always there uh, late 80s and beginning of 90s. And uh, he was the one that decided to call the the wave in the middle, in the middle of the spectrum of the dimensionless wave number spectrum, he was the one that started calling it dynamic. Maybe he was not, but he definitely popularized uh, the misnomer, in my opinion. But I, I really should be, I was thinking about it that this morning, I really should be thankful to Danny because it was his paper that I read in the year, uh, let's see, where, when, when was his paper published? 1975, yeah. Right after he published that paper, which today we're gonna briefly take a look at, is that I I was already working on this on these subjects of numerical mathematics. And uh, there it is. And uh, I ran into his paper early, uh, right soon after he published it, I ran into it, 1975, 76. And um, I understood it because I had been working on these subjects for a couple of years already, two or three years. But the issue was that he did not complete the work. So um, I decided to improve the work that he had done. It was extremely difficult work, but it could be done. And I was ready, as I say, ready, willing, and able to do it. Uh, and. And what I wanted to do was to redo his work, but complete it in the correct way. But at the time I realized that in order to do all the numerical mathematics that he had already done in an incomplete fashion, that I had to do, I had to start from the beginning. And that I do believe if, if I am correct, that led me to got a, uh, getting on the S-curve. Because I, need to, I needed to do the S-curve because I got into the numerical math. Yeah, you you had to compare the numerical math to the physical math, and and it, without the physical math, it couldn't be done. Uh, and now the physical math stood by itself, but it was a prerequisite for the numerical math. So if I remember correctly, it was his paper that we're going to briefly read today after we read this paper that got me into this whole thing about the S curve. So I'm thankful to him. Uh, Danny passed away, I think, about 10 years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a, uh, I'm going to show you. I have a, um, let me see how we do this. We go back in here, I think, yeah. I have a page on my site, which is called In Memoriam. Can you see it? It's kind of gray. Yeah, we can yeah, we see the gray. Yeah. I have, uh, uh, in order to be here, you gotta have, you gotta, you gotta, I don't know. I just 
put a, a whole bunch of people, not a whole bunch of, but maybe 10, 12 people that have passed away. Many of them have been my professors. I have Daryl Simons, Vujika Yevich, Danny Fred. That's what I wanted to talk to you. And I have them in here. Uh, when they were born and when he died, Danny Fred died in the year 2009. He was born in 1945, so he was one year older than I am. Uh, and he uh, was director of the Office of Hydrology National Weather Service in S Silver Spring, Maryland, the last few years of his, of his life. And in here, I have, I have in their memory, I have uh, put in here a paper of his. And he's got a whole bunch of papers. He was a very productive person. But this paper in particular is the one that I'm telling you that led me into the S-curve and everything else that I've done in this area of numerical mathematics, not in the environmental part, just in the mathematic part, which is, uh, that's what it is. So we're going to review this paper. So I just wanted to uh, get the record straight. And Danny was the one that um, uh, allowed me to, I, I just messed up in here, allowed me to get into this field because he had not completed the work. He had not completed the work. Okay, so I'm, we're back in here now. Uh, I'm going to get in here very quickly. Uh, uh, I got lost in here. Okay, fine. Can you see the green page? No, we can't see it. You can't. Okay, fine, because, because it needs to be shared. Okay? Yes. Okay, fine. Good. So, so again, it was the paper that Danny that led me to do the S-curve, which you already know. And it was the S-curve that after doing the S-curve, right after doing the S-curve, I had to do this paper. I had to study the convergence of four-point implicit waterway models. Because it was at the time that these mo models were popular. It was the so-called Priceman scheme, which we're going to talk about today. So um, convergence of four-point implicit waterway models. That's the subject today. And they, there's another paper also. I do want to say that um, I was at the time working, when I did this, I was working under the, the supervision of Professor Simons. So uh, I put his, his name on this paper. Uh, he kind of reviewed it briefly, very briefly. And, uh, but he was there because that was the thing that people usually do when you're uh, you know, uh, subaltern, as they say, a person that is beginning, then you put the name of some big guy or big strong person that is out there as chief or boss. That was Daryl Simons, one of my uh, professors, Daryl, and mentors in the, some sense. But you see in there the name of Horst Indelhofer, and that was, in a sense, lucky for me, because Horst uh, helped me write this paper. He was the author. Well, the idea was mine, but I told him you'd review this stuff and check it out. And you always need somebody to check it out. Uh, but Horst had, had a role to play in the development of the S-curve. Because again, he was there. And when I wrote the S-curve paper, and I think I may have mentioned this before, I gave it to him because he was there. He was a friend. He was a good friend. He was from Germany. He was a professor from Aachen, Germany, University of Aachen out there in Aachen, Germany. And he had come over on a short visit. I think it was a NATO fellowship. And I told him to review my S-curve. And he did. And unlike, <laughs> unlike many reviewers that I have had, he really reviewed it very carefully and found a mistake. He found a mistake in the paper. Because nobody's perfect, you know? The S-curve had a mistake. And he uh, uh, found it and and told me about it, and, and I checked it, and I realized there was a minus that had been taken uh, mistakenly as a plus or something like that. Very, very easy thing to figure out, as a matter of fact, F to figure out that, that he was right and I was wrong. And so I fixed it, and, and the paper got published in the correct way, due to Horst Lindelhofer. Now, Horst is now in Germany. I have been in touch briefly with him. I believe he's either retired or is very close to retirement. He's about my age, a little older than I am, by the way. I'm already pretty old as, as, as age goes. 
So uh, that's horse in the hole for in their assignment. So let's take a look at what we say in this paper. Uh, this is a very important paper, uh, difficult to read. And I'm going to hop over over the math because I don't believe that uh, you can get into it, but you should uh, uh, recognize or be aware not of the strict math, but rather of the concept that led us to do this, which is very, very important for the work that we do. So the numerical solution of the equation of open channel flow, this is the same in on equations, is an established concept or subject in the literature. Implicit schemes are preferred, we already talked about that, because they allow larger time steps, they're not constrained by the current condition. The four-point scheme, also referred to as Priceman, the Priceman scheme, has received wide attention. Wide attention. Who was Priceman? Priceman was, I believe, a mathematician. Uh, I believe his nationality is French. And he was working at Sogrea, which is a company, it's a, it's a water company in Grenoble, in France. And both Priceman and Kunch were working at Sogrea. Uh, Kanch was Polish, but he had landed in France and he decided to stay out there. So Priceman was in some sense a mentor for Kanch. Uh, that's, I think, has been established. Uh, but we, I say in here the stability and convergence properties of this scheme are not as yet fully understood. Why do I say that? Because uh, in the U.S. it was, it was, um, Danny Fred that applied the Priceman scheme in the U.S. as part of the modeling that he was doing at the, in the National Weather Service when he did his dissertation in Missouri Rolla in the year 1973. And subsequently, right after that, he wrote that paper in 1975 that we're going to be talking about extensively today. And since he had not done it, because I realized he hadn't done it, I figured he hadn't, it, it, it had to be done. It had to, we, we had to improve on the work that Danny Fred had done. Um, I do not believe Danny published that paper in a journal. I could be wrong, but I, I'm posit almost positive. He wrote a, uh, a report, and that's one of the reasons why the report is hard to read, because it was typed. It is really a hard report to read. I, uh, when I did this, I was, I was 30 years old, and I was very young and energetic young and energetic, as they say, and I could do that at that time. I don't think I could do it now, to be honest with you. But um, the same in an equations, uh, there exists no method for analyzing the stability and, co and convergence of an, a numerical solutions of this type. The numerous methods for analyzing stability and, and convergence of partial differential equations, among them the heuristic von Neumann approach. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to apply the uh, von Neumann approach to the Semenan equations following the work of Fred, but in a better way, more complete way. Okay. Stability and convergence. The essential feature of a numerical model is the replacement of a derivative such as uh, partial f with respect to s by a ratio of finite differences such as delta f over delta s. The numerical model must, must satisfy certain requirements of stability and convergence. Stability refers to the ability of a numerical scheme to march in time without generating unbounded error growth. Not go bananas, you know, they, you know, they, they have a way. If it's a, the model is unstable, they will just totally give you trash in a few minutes, okay, or after a while. Okay, that depends on whether it's weakly stable or strongly, weakly unstable or strongly unstable. Those things were, were discussed by O'Brien et al. in their paper that we have read. Stability is governed by round-off errors. Convergence is governed by discretization errors, according to O'Brien. And we agree with that. That is correct. In general, stability is impaired if the discretization is made finer while the, con the converse is true from the convergence standpoint. In other words, if you refine the grid, the convergence improves, but the stability demerits. It goes, it, it, and the reason for it is because all numerical analysis is a compromise. You, you cannot have two cores, a, a grid, 
nor can you have too fine a grip. Let me repeat that because it's extremely important. If you have too coarse a, a grid, you have a problem of convergence. And if you have too fine a grid, you, a grid, you have a problem of stability. So you either find yourself in the middle. Fortunately, once you have some practice, you can do that. You don't want to overdo it by doing too many calculations. You're coming up with the delta t is too, too small or the delta x too small. Because that's going to lead the computer to do a heck of a lot of calculations and eventually it's going to go bad. Because I haven't told you how it goes bad. It, it, by randomness, it generates uh, a division between two numbers that are close to each other in the denominator, and, and then that has a tendency to have things blow up. Okay? In practice, stability is necessary. You can't show your boss a model that is unstable. He or she will say, get out of here, get me a good model. Get me a, a stable model. If you show him or her a model that is stable but not convergent, that will be difficult to figure out if, you know, if you give him an answer or give her an answer and you say it's 100 and really it's 120, it's not convergent. But they can't figure it out immediately. You, an unstable model, you can say it's wrong. But a non-convergent model, you'd have to dig in and determine where exactly if it is indeed right or wrong. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here in this class. The numerical properties have been studied by Liggett and Kunch. In the year 1975, Liggett uh, and Kunch wrote a paper. I'm not sure whether it was Kunch or it was Liggett. I am almost positive. I don't uh, no respect to Professor Liggett. He's a good friend of mine. Well, acquaintance more than friend. Uh, but Kunch was very young at the time, and he must have done the work, and they got together, and they published this good paper. But it was incomplete. They didn't do it. They didn't do the whole thing. Uh, they used a simple system of linear equations. But you realize that people like Professor Pons coming after these people, uh, I'm looking for holes, basically. I'm looking to learning what they have done and figure out if they had done it wrong or it could be done better. And exactly that's what happened in the case of Liggett and Kunch. Liggett and Kunch had done some simple modeling. And uh, uh, Fred had done a little better, but still not complete. Okay. Okay, Fred has analyzed the numerical properties. He used a linearized version of the same Venan, which we did also following Leggett and Widom, but simplified, here it is. Here's the key or the crux of this matter. But simplify the equation of motion by neglecting the convective inertia in bed slope terms and the equation of continuity by neglecting the wedge storage term. I don't know exactly why he did that. Uh, I've known people that have messed with, messed with, that's not the word, that neglected terms in the equation of motion, right? We do that all the time, kinematic wave, dy dynamic wave. But the equation of continuity, they neglected one term in there. There's three terms in the equation of continuity. They, for, one, for whatever reason, I don't know, he just figured out he couldn't do it. The complete linear analysis has been made possible by the study of two of the writers, that's us, who formulated the analytical solution for the propagation of sinusoidal perturbations in open channel flow on the basis of a linearized version of the same and equations, the equations of, of Leichhardt and Widow, basically. So we did that. That's We're saying, saying that that can be done, and it was done in this paper. Present analysis or the present study aims to determine the convergence properties of the four-point implicit numerical model. The celerity and attenuation of the numerical solution will be compared with those of the analytical solution. We already had an analytical solution. The von Neumann technique will be used in this regard. The conclusions relate to the assessment of convergence as a function of relevant physical and numerical parameters. We found something very interesting in this paper. And, uh, but the paper is so thick that very few people have read it. <laughs> in some sense, uh, you're among the few that are going to have, the, I guess you could say, the privilege or luck to read this paper with, with the author so that he can explain it to you in detail how, how, what this whole thing contains. There's a, lot of, a few things in there that are fascinating, interesting. We'll see that. Let's get in there. Let's not spend a lot of time in the, in the preliminaries. We have the watery continuity equation. These, we have the equation of motion. These are the equations of Leichhardt and Widom. We have the perturbation. The equation, the perturbed equations also uh, from, in some sense, yeah, that's in some sense our work. 
And this, this comes from the S-curve. Then the S-curve work. Analytical solution, we have the celerity, the analytical celerity. When we uh, wrote our S-curve paper, we were using C with a little carrot with a hat on top. But then later I got smarter and realized that that little hat on top of the variable was, was producing a barrier. People weren't reading it because they were unfamiliar with the term. That was high, complicated math. So then I got a little smarter and I decided to use a C star, which, is, which I reckon that it is the so-called Einstein equation. When Einstein, Hans Einstein, not, not, uh, not the father, but the son, who taught at uh, UC Berkeley for 25 years, Einstein used star, uh, subscript star, to denote dimensionless. So I, uh, here, we use the star. Not only use the star, but when we typed it, we realized we couldn't put the carrot in there. It's it's, it's very difficult to put the carrot on top of a. We could barely put a bar, let 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 alone a carrot. So at any rate, we put it in there, and then we have for the attenuation the log decrement defined as follows, which means that the amplitude at t at at um, at t zero plus t is equal to the amplitude at zero to the e to the delta, where L delta is the, the, um, the log decrement. We found that from the Wiley book, the math book, uh, Advanced Engineering Mathematics, which, by the way, it was a textbook. That was a textbook when I took math over at the, in the year 1974 over at uh, Colorado State. I think I have told the story of how I went to talk to Dr. Simons, and he said, Pons, everybody that signs up with our program takes that course of math. I said, sure, oh, really, sure, okay, fine. And I took it. I took it because I had to take it. And it, it benefited me immensely because I was able to not be fearful about the math that was up and coming, which was this math. This was done two, three years later after I had taken it math course. So numerical solution. By the way, math is just, you stick with it, eventually you get it. That has happened to me several times. You have to stick with it. So the point, uh, four-point implicit. Here we're going to talk about the famous four-point implicit. Uh, we have the four points in here, which you, all of you are familiar with. Uh, but this is implicit. This is not explicit, like, like the paper we just did last week was, no, it was Monday. The paper we did Monday was an explicit scheme where the J plus one, N plus one value was solved in terms of the other three. In an explicit scheme, you directly solve everything within a, within a cell. In an implicit scheme, you cannot because you have unknowns in the unknown level which occur together. So you have to solve this with a mat matrix inversion algorithm. But this is, the, once you set up the algorithm, it, it really, it's called a sparse matrix. And there are solutions for sparse matrices. Actually, you can, I'm sure you can go on the web these days and look for sparse matrices, and you may actually find an algorithm that will do it for you, and you wouldn't have to develop it. But no, at the time, we didn't have those things. We didn't have the web. We're talking about middle 70s. We didn't have the web. We had to do it on our own. As a matter of fact, it was Professor Mahmoud that first uh, introduced me to the, to the matrix inversion. He said, Pons, uh, we're going to do this. I said, sure. It took me a day or two, not too much, not too long. I, there was a reference out there. No, there was no reference. We had to do it from scratch. He told me what to do, and I sat down to do it, and we did it. And th that's, called, that's called the so-called uh, so double sweep algorithm. In the double sweep algorithm, you go, you pick up a boundary condition, on the upper end, and you sweep to the downstream and then pick up a, a boundary condition at the downstream end and then sweep back. So that's, that's why it's called double sweep. Fairly easy stuff to do if you're good at math. And I was, I was good at math. Not now, but I was good at math at the time. I remember Professor Mahmoud actually that was working on a problem he could not solve. Everybody has limitations. And he came to me and said, Pons, uh, help me out with this. You do it. And I said, I took it as a challenge. And I went to my office and I sat down for two or three hours. And I did it. 
he was surprised that it had been done so quickly. He thought I was going to take a, a, a few days to do that kind of work, but we, we were young and, and assertive, and that's the way we did it. We, do, we were doing things at the time. So we have here, these three equations are the equations for the famous um, four-point scheme. Now, if you look at this, it kind of resembles the Muskingum, but differently, because the Muskingum only has one equation. Here we have three equations. We have the function equation, functional equation, the derivative of the function with respect to time, and the derivative of the function with respect to x. But the four points are, are getting into the picture. But interestingly enough, we have a theta in there. So it's a weighting factor. If the theta is 1 half, put in here theta 1 half. You have 1 half, so 1 fourth, 1 fourth over here. Take 1 fourth out because it's the same. That means that the function is equal to an average of all the values, of all the grid values. So for theta 1 half, and it's, it is an average. For theta equal 1, you eliminate the, the known values. The known values are eliminated. The initial conditions are eliminated. And for theta equals 0, you eliminate the, the unknowns. So theta equals 0 is no good, because if you eliminate the unknowns, then you're never going to go get anywhere, right? But you could use theta 0.5, or you could use theta 1, or 0.6, or 0.7. So which one to use? That's what we're going to answer in this class. OK, so now, for the function, it's like this. For the function, they did not, they decided not to use the theta for the function. Because I'm giving it to you the way they did it. I didn't invent this stuff. This is basically Preisman scheme, the Preisman scheme. And for the uh, derivative with respect to space, the spatial, he did the same thing. Only that in, in this case, it was a minus because it was a derivative. While over here, it's a plus. This, uh, this is a strict average. OK, so we have in here the same situation with the theta. It is the same theta. They didn't put two thetas in here. Like I said, this is the Preisman scheme, developed by Preisman in 1961. Preisman wrote a paper in 1961. Let me see if I listed that in here. No, I don't. But there's a paper by Preisman somewhere out there that presents these equations over here. OK. So now we're going to we're gonna get going here, and we say the weighting factor is introduced in the function and its space and, and its space derivative to allow or spatial derivative I should put in spatial derivative to allow greater flexibility in the actual operation. While the stable range is 0.5 to one, a strongly stable range is 0.6 to one, and people have actually discussed in the literature as to what the value of theta should be. Now we know that it should be at least 0.55. But you could say 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Which one? We will decide later on. Um, 0.55 is recommended as part of RAS, take RAS unsteady, would run the, with 0.55 at the beginning. They will don't run anything less than 0.55, which because it will be counterproductive. You, you can start getting oscillations. And it, once you start getting the oscillations, then it will eventually break the model. So you don't want to risk it. Everybody knows that with 0.55, you you put enough aspirin in there because it's really an aspirin to control the computation. But sometimes there are so many variations in there that 0.55 is not um, sufficient. And therefore, we have to put 0.6 or 0.65. There are some people, and I know them, I'm not going to mention names, that actually go out there and, and put one in there because they figure, you know, I'm not going to bother with this. Let's say, let me just put one. And they end up um, briefly or succinctly obliterating the result at the top. In other words, the signal, the main signal is, is erased a little bit. As a matter of fact, I could tell you what it is correct, but very few people have done it, that one theta equal one is not the limit. You can put theta equal one point five or two, and the the higher the theta, outside of the range and normal range of operation, the more numerical diffusion you'll get because it is like getting a whole bunch of aspirin at one time. And and the more the higher the theta, the more obliterated or the more the more the obliteration of the result. That's a fact. 
Not too many people do it. I have done it because I work with this system for many years. We just try it. Let's see what happens. What the heck, you know? And it, it, it obliterates the results. In, in other words, it's wrong because you're trying to get accuracy in here. It's not just a question of stability, but also of accuracy. That is convergence. You know, accuracy is kind of akin to convergence. Uh, O'Brien et, et al. call it convergence, and that's why we kind of mimicking what they have said. But really, the word is accuracy. Okay, so we're going to substitute the values in here. And this is the O'Brien. No, I'm sorry, not the O'Brien. This is the uh, von Neumann technique with the caveat that we non-dimensionalized it. I am not sure that von Neumann did that dimension, non-dimensionalization. But he created or he developed this. He did not create. He did not create the exponential. But he used this in, the, in numerical analysis extensively. That's what people say. I wasn't there. But th therefore, this formula was improved by us by making it dimensionless, by using stars. Everything had a star, sigma star, x star, beta star, t star. You can see it there. OK? So and what are the stars? The stars come in to what we call in here, um, as you can see, X over S sub o, D sub o over S sub o, that's L sub o. That's our famous L sub o. It's the length along the channel where it drops a head equal to its depth. You heard that, those terms before. We have them in here. And for the period, it's the same thing. It's T sub o, which is which the velocity comes in. The velocity is the time that it takes the flow to move from the, from the beginning to the end of the L sub O. So these are the, the non-dimensionalizations of the system. I should tell you that if these non-dimensionalizations are not correct, that you won't get to the answer. That happened to Farrick. Farrick missed on the L sub O because he didn't know about it. He just called it L or something like this, and it wasn't going to work. And it never worked for Farrick, but it worked for us. Uh, you recall that we already have covered this ground. Okay, now here we're going to get into the heavy math, which I obviously I'm not going to get into detail. It will take forever for us to dig through these equations. But let me just say the substitution yields these equations and so forth. Equations 12 and 13, 12 and 13, constitute a set of two homogeneous equations. The homogeneous uh, algebraic equations, and therefore, this, for the solution to be non-trivial, the determinant of the coefficient matrix must vanish. I learned that in the Wiley book. The Wiley book explicitly talks about matrices. And in, in order to do that trick of, of figuring out uh, that uh, the, determinant of the determinant of the coefficient matrix should drive itself to zero, then you've got to understand what, what Wiley was saying in his book. Okay, so we do that, and this is the, sa the same kind of math that we use for the S-curve, with the difference that in the S-curve there was no deltas. And in here we have deltas, delta x's and delta t's. And we get the same here, all this math in here that you got to follow. Okay, and this is, like, as you can see, now this is kind of similar to the one we did before, right? The one that we did Monday. If you notice, kind of similar. Because we're using the same methodology, only that Monday we did it for the explicit scheme. Uh, of the convection equation. Here we're going to do it for the implicit scheme of Priceman. That's the difference. And by the way, these methodologies could be used for any scheme in any field, not just hydraulics. You can do it in, in heat transport, you can do it in contaminant transport, you can just do about any, the same tools can be used in all fields, in all the applications of numerical analysis. Numerical analysis is nothing but replacing the delta partial for a delta total uh, uh, delta, the capital delta. And that can be done in many fields, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, chemical engineering, and so on and so forth, or even straight mathematics. Finally, we get the log decrement. The log decrement over here is B, 2 pi b sub i or, uh, beta sub i over beta sub r. If you notice this, this comes we recollect that this is the same thing that we did when we did our S curve. That the delta was the B sub i over B imagine, beta imaginary over the beta real. So we come in here, and now we're going to do our convergence analysis, 
which was similar to what we did uh, uh, this last Monday, R1 and R2, which come from the work of Lender C. Let me see if I have actually put a Lender C. No, I haven't put a Lender C, but this was at the time so common that I didn't feel that we had to go that back. Uh, Lender C, 1965. Uh, Fred was 1975. And Fred was using all these things already. But Fred did quote Lender C, by the way. Uh, Lender C is the earliest reference that we have to these methodologies, by the way. Lender C from, from Holland, from, I, from the Netherlands. So value R1 is the attenuation ratio, and R2 is the translation ratio, the phase, the phase error. For R1 equal to R2 equal to 1, there is an exact coincidence between analytical and numerical solutions. We get the right answer. And finally, we have these equations, and we get the chart. And this is where the plot thickens, because now we're going to have only one chart. And here I made a mistake again, the same mistake of to put nine charts together into one chart. The same mistake I did. I was kind of in, in a simplifying mood. And there's a mistake. That is nice to see it all connected and not put together in one page, but uh, it's, it's difficult to dig. So perhaps we should have done for friendliness, for the issue of friendliness, or the, to, to separate it into nine charts. But no, we did it into one chart. It's all here. We never, we have not worked on it to separate it. So what do we have in here? We have, let's see what we have in here. We have R1s. So this whole chart is R1. The R2s are coming in later. These are the R2s. So the, the, this is the R1s, R1, 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 okay? This, uh, the top three, okay, I'm gonna try to figure this out. The top three is for sigma 0.1. And you gotta realize that in here, we use these figures from the old paper, so it's sigma hat, so allow, allow me a little bit of latitude. When we do this, we are now in the process of drawing all these figures or my 52 papers we're gonna we're about 20 30 percent done it's gonna take us a couple of years to do this work because the person that is doing it doesn't do it at full time but the point is that all this stuff will be converted and once we convert it we will refer to it as sigma star not sigma hat okay so over here across the plane it is for kinematic waves over here is for the so-called gravity waves in our paper, in our S paper. And in here are the dynamic waves of um, Fred, the dynamic waves of Fred, the ones that I call mixed kinematic dynamic. Why? Because the sigma is in the middle. You know, the sigma in the middle. Imagine the, the, the dimension is wave number spectrum, and the sigma is in the middle. So we have kinematic, dynamic of Fred, and gravity of RS curve or Lagrange waves, also called Lagrange waves in some, in some places. Okay, now over here, over here we have, oh, we also have currents. We use three currents, 0.25, 1, and 4. And we have three resolutions, pi over 10, which is coarse, pi over 40, intermediate, and pi over 100 is refined. So we have waves, one, two, three types of waves, resolution, one, two, three types of resolution, and, and current numbers, current numbers in there, in the graph, current numbers. And fruit numbers, fruit numbers are in there too, by the way. So we varied, we varied uh, in theta. So we, we, we're varying one, two, three, four, five, actually, five, six. So one, one variable is a function of one, two, three, four. It, it's a function of theta, or sigma, and fruit, and current number four. All of them in there for, for the issue of uh, conciseness. Okay, now, what we're going to say from the analysis of these charts is the following. That when you have a kinematic wave, the system is well-behaved. When you have a, gra uh, a wave of Lagrange, the system is reasonably well behaved. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say similarly well behaved because they look the same. If you look at, at this, this line in here, the top, 
the top graph and the bottom graph, they look the same. And they're for different wave size. Don't ask me why. I mean, that's the way, the way, the way Mother Nature put it together. We're just, we're just expressing in, in the language of science, which is math, what is natural that it came from the equations. And the equations is coming from the two concepts or principles of mass and momentum conservation. Okay? So, but in the middle, you have a mess. We really have a mess. Not a, a mess because we can't set, the, we, can, we cannot choose the theta freely. The objective is to choose the theta in there. And we're not going to be able to choose the theta over here. Worse over here. No, no, no. This is the worst. This is the worst for very coarse values. For finer values, it's a little good. It gets a little better, but still not very good. Over here, you would have to guess at the theta being about 0.62 in order to get the right answer. And you're not, not, not over here. I'm sorry. Over here, you can't even guess. So the conclusion that we get out of this is we're going to have a hard time trying to figure out what theta to use in a dynamic wave of Fred. That's what this chart says. Because this is ill behaved. And in fact, as a matter of fact, uh, practice proves us correct that you have a hard time. I've gone in many places. I've got to many places. Hmm. Not many, a few, let's be honest. Throw four or five places where people have complained to me that they couldn't run the implicit scheme because they couldn't choose the theta through a broad range of problems. The theta was a problem. Uh, you could choose it. Uh, you could put it in there, theta equal one, but then the answer will be obliterated. So you don't want that. But what correct theta, that is a difficult problem. So again, this also confirms that the uh, dynamic wave of, of Fred, it's not there for us to calculate it. And I think I already said that in, in class. Uh, attenuation is so high that why would you want to calculate a wave that is attenuated so much? And you would, guys would recall that I have mentioned that Leighton and Whittam said that precisely. I don't know how is it that Leighton and Whittam got their insight, but they did have a lot of insight. They had a lot of math in that paper too, by the way. It was a good paper. I read it many, many times. The Leighton and Whittam paper originating the concept, not the concept, but defining or naming the concept of kinematic wave, which at the time people had started using but they really didn't know much about it. You would recall that Seven used the concept of kinematic wave without calling it kinematic wave because he was doing this work in the year 1900. And it was only the 19, in 1954 that Leighton and Whittam, two mathematicians, were able to tell us what, what it is that actually Seven was doing. This is interesting and fascinating. So that's basically the crux of this matter here. With the uh, additional uh, situation that we did the R2 also. This is the R2. And the R2, as you can see, is a wholly different picture. It doesn't change like a triangle. It changes like a parabola. It, uh, it changes with theta, with theta, according to the parabola. The objective of this whole exercise is to figure out what theta to use. And these charts over here are telling us, well, really, it depends on the kind of wave you're running. If you're running in the middle of the spectrum, you're going to have a hard time figuring out what data to use. Over here, this is kind of subdued because it's not as, as violently varying as the other one. But it does, uh, here in the middle of the spectrum, it gives you misbehavior. Can you see that misbehavior? This says amplification. This also even says that the amplification is going to go even for theta as 0.5 or 0.6 if you were in the domain of the dynamic wave of Fred, dynamic wave of Fred. So basically, in a nutshell, we're basically saying, don't run the, the dynamic wave of Fred. We didn't say so. We just left it in there for people to elaborate, to, to study. Actually, we didn't call it for, by proper name. We just said, this is a graph, and you examine it, and you see what you can find from the graph. Okay, uh, summary and conclusions. Comprehensive theoretical treatment of the convergence of the four point implicit is presented. Propagation, celerity, and attenuation are calculated. Convergence is shown to be a function of the complex interaction of five parameters the fruit number, the dimensionless wave number, our dimensionless wave number, the spatial resolution, 
the Quran number and, and the weighting factor. Now, the special resolution This is this is only for pi equal to pi over ten, so this is the worst, and it's still reasonably good. I do not believe I plotted in here the alpha equal pi over one hundred. If I had in the original paper, it would have shown in here. So I didn't think it was necessary to do that because it was this is kind of a secondary kind of a. Not a secondary, but it was not as violently varying as the first one. But we figured, since th these two are coupled, you can't separate one from the other. Then, if you have one that is violent, the other one's going to be violent too. Uh, one of them is for the amplitude, and the other one is for the phase. Phase, in other words, horizontal as opposed to uh, uh, vertical movement. So, convergence is shown to be a function of the complex interaction of these five parameters. Convergence analysis is carried out for fluid numbers in the subcritical regime. Following conclusion, the simulation is reasonably good for small and for large sigma stars. For intermediate values, dynamic weights, the accuracy of the simulation is highly dependent on the correct value of the weighting factor. In practice, an optimum value of theta that will assure both stability and convergence may be difficult to determine, and that's shown by practice. Values of theta less than 0.5 always cause numerical amplification. Values of theta between 0.5 to 1 may cause amplification or attenuation because, because the curves are crossing on top, like over here. The curves are crossing on top, right here, the crossing of the accuracy, to determine the accuracy. Highly dependent on the correct value. Okay, value of theta equal one always causes numerical at, um, attenuation. That's because over here, the one always oh, see over here. It's over here, so we basically confirm what is correct. If you run it with theta equal one, you get an answer no matter what. It's a bad answer, but you get an answer. Okay, so that's. Basically, what we are going to say in regards to this, we, we have a caveat in here. We say the findings are obtained by using a linearized version. Emphasis should be placed on the qualitative nature. We just say, don't get too hot in here. This is qualitative, but still is a good qualitative because it gives you some idea of what's actually happening. Uh, performance of a nonlinear model can only be assessed through careful design numerical experiments. We basically say for the nonlinear model, you got to do experiments in the field or that is in the laboratory. Now, this stuff is nice, but it is for linear only. And the, the actual world has a tendency to be nonlinear. Okay, Professor Indelhofer was awarded a Nader's Fellowship. These are the R equations for the S curve and the references, and that is it for this paper. So now I am going to show you what does the theta do for us in our calculation? What's the, what does the theta do for us in our calculation? Now, this graph was put together very early in, on our website. It was one of the first graphs that we put together around the year 2000. We, uh, we were beginning the web in the year 1999, and I think it was in the year 2000 that I had a student, I don't remember her name right now, but um, she was good, like most people are, with Excel. I said, let's do a graph in Excel. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an output of my dynamic wave model, and you vary the theta. On the, you vary the theta. I'm going to give you the dynamic wave model that I had. You vary the theta between 0.49 to 1. And then you let me know what are the results and, and plot the results. This whole, th whole thing could be done in Fortran, and then you pick up and cut and paste into an Excel sheet. You could also do it in an Excel sheet, but we already had it in Fortran. You know, we, we, we're very good with Fortran. I, I wrote a book with, uh, on Fortran uh, 30 years ago. So I think I already mentioned to you that when uh, Marcela Diaz did her PHP work on the Unity Stable channel, I said, Marcela, uh, I... Uh, I could check your check your PHP, but I'm not going to do that. I have a ruler, so 
I, I, set up, I set up the Fortran program. I remember it took me uh, three or four hours to do the Fortran program. And then I checked it. I checked her program against mine, figuring it that they had to be the same. And she was correct. She did it correctly. She was very cautious, careful. Because you got to be careful when you do these things. And the two answers, the PHP and the Fortran, came out the same way. Which, by the way, the same thing happened with uh, the work with Janet. We're, we're going to talk about that later. So she did that. And, and interestingly, though, we could not uh, show the entire thing because there's a lot of refinement in the process. If you show the top, you cannot show the bottom. If you show the bottom, you cannot show the top. If you wanted to show both at the same time, you would have to do a huge scale, which could not be shown. And then at that point, I'm going to say the following. I missed in here. I should have told her, do two plots, one at the bottom to show the instability and one at the top to show the non-convergence. But no, I didn't. I mean, nobody's perfect. I said, I'm really interested in, uh, in the instability. We were focused on the instability. So I said, you come down on the curve. This is a sine curve. This is like the beginning of the sine curve. Okay, I said, you come down on the curve and expand it and show the variability with data. And we chose 0 0.49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 55, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. We covered the range. We wanted to get to 55 because this is where the issue, the issue was what, what happens when the theta varies from 0.5 to 0.55. Now, this is a model that I had developed um, based on the Priceman scheme, numerical scheme, linear analysis of Kanj. Kanj did the linear analysis. In his book in 1955, 1960, no, 75, I'm sorry, he explains how you do this. So I, we follow Kanj and we did this work based on the work of Kanj. Uh, Fred, though, had decided something differently. Because obviously, Kanch was coming from Europe, from Genovo. Fred was coming from the University of Missouri Rolla in the United States, and he had done something different. And for Fred, the linear analysis was not enough. So he did a nonlinear analysis. So technically speaking, the two models are not quite the same because one of them is a little bit more sophisticated. The Fred model was more sophisticated. But on the, same, on the same vein, he was doing many more computations and the likelihood of it becoming unstable, although probably unbeknownst to Fred, I don't know, I never talked to Fred about this, whether he realized that by going nonlinear, he was going more unstable in the long run. I don't know. But the point is that Fred was doing a nonlinear, Kanch was doing a linear. We decided to do first linear, and then we eventually, we had a lot of energy at that time, we did nonlinear too. In order to do the nonlinear, you have to do what is called a newton raphson algorithm. You remember the law of Newton, the errors, finding an error with Newton. Well, the newton raphson is the application of Newton, the law of Newton, to, to a system of, of equations, a system of algebraic equations. It's a very detailed calculation, by the way. I never actually published that. I wouldn't be able to do it now, I'm sure. It was just too complicated. At the time, we had all, all the information and so forth. But I proved to myself that if you, if you use a reasonable pi over, pi over delta x, about 100, which is what we recommend, 50 to 100, at least 50 and if not 100, then you would, need the, you would not need the sophistication of the newton raphson That is the one that Fred had implemented in his NWS model. So Kanch was right. Kanch said, no, I'm going to decrease the delta x and increase the time. I have the computer, even though in, at that time the computers were kind of slow, but still, you could sit around. And remember, there's always something to be considered. Use the computer, but don't make it too long a calculation because it's going, it's going to cause problems in the long run. That's why I don't believe that a problem can run for 24 hours on the CPU. It's too much. Can you imagine that CPU right now are doing millions of calculations per second? So in order to run 24 hours, you imagine the trillion of calculations that he has to do. At that point, anything could happen. And you re the only reason why it doesn't happen is because you knowingly or unknowingly are introducing diffusion terms 
filters, all sorts of stuff. There's explicit filters and implicit filters. Boy, we know that. And I'll talk about that in more detail later on. But filters, that is aspirins, could be introduced at any time in the process. And the more filters you use, the more stable the model is, the less convergent. You see how this is an art? It's fascinating, art, numerical analysis. Really fascinating. I've been working on this for almost 50 years now. When I arrived in Colorado State in the year 1973, that's 48 years ago, this is the first problem that uh, Mahmoud told me. He said, Pons, we're going to do numerical modeling of sand waves. I said, oh, cool. <laughs> I heard about numerical modeling, but I never heard of sand waves. But we're going to do that. We're gonna, I can explain to you later how we did that. But uh, So this is the answer by this lady. Not the answer. She ran the model and she plotted it. She put the colors in there and so forth. It's a nice graph. I love this graph. It's one of the early graphs on my website. But this does show, look at this, that for the pink color, 0 0.49, it is violently unstable. 0 0.50, it's over here. You can see 0 0.49, 0 0.50. The blue one is 0.51. The, the colors are hard to discern, but you can see now 0 0.49, 0 0.50, 0 0.51, 0 0.52, 0 0.53. And then eventually you get to 0.6 is the green one and the gray one. This is the gray one over here, the green one. The gray one is over here. If it's over here already phased out, that means that it's going to cut on the top. There's going to be a cut on the top because the real answer comes in this direction. You see? So, so point one is already a cut on the top. The one that is less cut on the top is the blue, which is 0.6. Can you see that? The 0.6 is the blue. That's the one that is close to the real answer. So that's not going to have too much of a shading on the top. And the 0.55, it's out here somewhere. So the 0.55 is the good one. Based, even though we have not seen the top, but we do realize that if this starts phasing out, then it will phase out on the top too. There's no way of recovering itself. Okay? So conclusion based on this graph. In the implicit scheme, the theta 0.55 is the beginning of improvement. Anything above 0.55 would have to be the case. Anything below, it will develop these things in here. And if you let it run for a long time, it will destroy the computation because it will become nonlinearity in the, at the cell level. You have to have linearity from one point to the next. Linearity means su su smooth variation. If you have a sharp variation, that's the end of the computation. If you didn't see it that time, you'll see it later. It has to be smooth. It has to be linear. The variation should be linear. The roundoff and discretization error should be relatively small. Okay, so with that, then we finish. I don't recall the name of the lady, but uh, now we didn't put it in there. So. So now we go to the next paper, which is Effect of Cross-Sectional Shape on Flow Velocity. Uh, I put this in here to show something to you, that modeling is a very uh, intense process. And if the physical world deviates from the model and from the assumptions, then you're more likely to run into trouble. You know now what run into trouble means. It becomes unstable and non-convergent. And since that's, you don't want that, you want a model that is stable and convergent. First stable and then convergent. Stability becomes a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. It has to be convergent. So first stable, first you fix the big problem, which is st stability. Once it's stable, then you fix the little problem, which is convergence. And for that purpose, you have got to know a set, you have to have a sense of what the answer is going to be, more or less. If you don't have any sense, then you don't have any business doing this. Because you can get anything and you think it's correct, and it is not correct. So, now, what happens is this. After you do this a hundred times, you get a sense of everything. <laughs> That's the truth. At the beginning, you don't know. Anything is a surprise. But if you do it a hundred times, and in order to do it a hundred times, all you need to do is work at it for three months. Or something like that. There's people that have run Hekras unsteady in and out over at West. Those gentlemen that are working with us, they work with uh, in, uh, with uh, HEC RAS, not RAS, all of them, in and out. It's their business. It's their 
bread and butter, so to speak. So they're good. They're better than I am. That's why I recommend that you guys go to them because I know a lot about the theory, but when it comes down to the practice, I don't run daily those models as they do. And you know, perfection is re practice requires, or perfection requires practice. I know those people are good. And I'm hoping you'll be happy with them once the whole thing settles. At this point, you're still working on it. Uh, okay, so now, Kanch. Kanch wrote a paper, a book in 1980. He called it Practical Aspects of Computational River Hydraulics. Um, now, Kanch worked, I believe, most of his life with Sogrea. He joined Sogrea when he was a young man. He must have been 35 or 40. He's right, right now, he's more than, more than, he's in the middle 80s, at least in the middle 80s. I'm guessing that Kanj is at least 10 years older than I am. 15 would be more, actually more appropriate guess. So if I'm 75, he's 90, okay? So Kanj wrote his paper, this book in the year 1980, 1980 to 2020, 22 years, 40, 42 years ago, 41 years ago. So 41 subtract, so he, when he was 40, he was about in the middle of 40s, he wrote this paper, Practical Aspects. He and other people had done uh, his co-authors. This is Kanj, Holly, and Verwe. Verwe was a Dutch professor, I think. Verwe was a professor over in the Netherlands. And Holly was a classmate of mine. Interesting, interestingly, Holly, uh, Forrest Holly, had gotten a degree uh, under Simons at Colorado State at about the same time I did I did get mine. And then he uh, went to work um, in the East Coast and sooner or later, or more soon than later, he decided that he wanted to go to work with Kanj. So he quit over his job over at the East Coast and went to work with Kanj and he stayed with Kanj for a bunch of years. I don't recall exactly the details of his bio data. But in 1980, so three or four years later, that this thing happened because Boris Holly graduated at about the same time I graduated uh, from the same program, as a matter of fact. So Forrest was with Kanch for a number of years in the early 80s. It, would have, it could have been 1978 to 1985 or so. Don't hold me to those figures because I have not seen the Holly CV. But I know he worked with Kanch because he visited with me in the middle eighties and he was at San Diego for some meeting. We had a meeting, we, had, we were part of a committee and we were in the same committee. And so we met for a cup, uh, for a day, actually those committees meet for a day. And I had a, uh, a chance to chat with Forrest who had, who had come from France. And he said it was where he was at the time. He told me, he confirmed at the time what I had known or I knew already that he was working with Kanch. So he and Kanch and he and some other gentlemen put together this book, Practical Aspects of Computational River Hydraulics. Now I need gonna say something that needs to be said. It is an excellent book and therefore very little read. That's just the way the way the ball bounces. I can tell you tons of stories about that. Uh, I have briefly looked into it. It is very practical because Kanj was doing a lot of practice at that time. But let's get to the point in here. This is a very thick book, about two, 300 pages. And I'm going to be talking about page 200 here, composite main channel, because I'm going to make a point in here. The point I'm going to make is that you can have a prototype and the prototype is simple, a prototype channel. Then you can come up with beautiful answers as long as the prototype is simple. But if the prototype starts getting nasty or complicated, then, then the problem is not gonna, mis it's not gonna behave as, as well as you think it could or would. And that's what Kanch is saying in here right now. In order to simplify an otherwise extremely complex phenomenon, we may consider a flood, and he talks about the channel in there, right? Uh, in order to be able to calibrate a composite section, now the composite section is the section that we use in engineering because if we're gonna calculate the floods, the floods are going to overflow. And this is interesting because it brings up the question of how frequent is the overflow. Now, to nail that answer correctly, you have to learn your geomorphology, your fluvial geomorphology. The geomorphologists say, loosely I think, 
that between two to five year frequency is when the flow is, when the channel is going to overflow. So you expect water to come out of the channel every two to five years. But isn't that kind of low? I mean, too repetitive or repetitious? And the answer is, the geomorphologist would say, well, I don't know. That's the way it happens. I mean, don't ask me, ask nature, okay? So nature, when she forms a channel, she has a way of overflowing, okay, because there's a floodplain, and she does it, she does so every two to five years. So if we want to calculate anything above two to five years, and typically that's what we want to do, we're going to have to do a calculation of the overflow. And that's what she, uh, Kanch is talking about here, how we're going to consider the calibration of the model under overflow conditions. So we have in here uh, three channels in here. We have a portion of a channel in bank, which is well-behaved, type of trapezoidal, well-behaved. Then when it goes over flow, it goes like two di three dimensional. We consider it to be one dimensional because that's all we could do at the time, right? Even though to right now, we cannot do three dimensions. If we do two dimensions, and we're gonna do that at the end of this class, we're still short because nature is three dimensional. We're still short even with the two dimensional models. We happen to know that because I worked on two dimensional models. And I was convinced at the time, uh, after working on it for two years, yeah, two years, that we couldn't solve all the problems with two dimensions. It had to be three dimensions. And at the time, we figured that we couldn't do it. We didn't have the resources or the wherewithal to do the three dimension at the time. That was the year 1980. We're, we're 2021, it was still, it was still, I guess you could say working on the on the development of the routine three dimensional model. Okay, I've heard things about the Europeans, the French being or having done it, but I since I don't really really work daily on that subject, I I don't want to give an opinion on that. The people that are the, the people of West will be good at that opinion, giving opinions about the development of three dimensional models as opposed to two dimensional models. Two dimensional models are not routine. I remember when when, um, when Rosa Aguilar completed her work with us in the year 2014, that was seven years ago, she got employed by West and then we met briefly afterwards and I said, Rosa, what are you doing? And she said, Professor Pons, we're doing 2D modeling on the RAS. I said, cool, at least here, we." I talked about it. I didn't ask you to run it, but I did talk about it. You know what it is. Uh, and we get to the point when we talk about it, as you guys know very well. So she was working on 2D models. I don't know what she's doing now. I think she's on leave right now. She had, she had a baby recently. But the point is that 2D models are being used out there extensively. Routine operations. They've been, they've been so for, I'm going to say, 15 years. At least 15 years of 2D modeling. Routine. HCC RAS. Okay. So... Figure five nine. Now, Kanch is going to try to tell in here what uh, what has been done. Interestingly, shown the results of a series of real life experiments conducted on the river Tvertsa. I don't pronounce that Tvertsa in the Soviet Union. Rusino. It is interesting that Kanch had a pipeline to the Soviet Union at the time. Why? Because he was Polish. Polish are right next to the Soviet, to the ex-Soviets. So I do believe, I could be wrong in here, but I do believe that he was able to read or else understand Russian. And that's why he mentions quite a bit the Russian work, okay? Uh, the Russians, as you know, from my discussions and so forth, uh, have produced quite a few very good works. I mean, talk about Vedernikov, Toshibotarev, and so forth. Uh, but uh, a lot of it has been lost in the translation and so forth. So, but now we have Kanch coming up with a uh, citation to a Russian gentleman by the name of Rusinov on, on, a, on something that he's going to talk about here at this point. The experiments consisted of a number of artificial floods with flood peaks which were well-defined and at different stages from fl one flood to another. In other words, you have a flood peak that is in bank, a flood peak that is kind of in the middle where, where the channel is expanding, and then a flood peak, which is when the flood is, uh, is heavy. Like uh, you have eight feet over bank, 
if you don't revamp, I mean, everybody's already wet and even dying, right? Do we have a fetal? Yes, we do. There are se several instances that have been mentioned in the literature where here in the US we had a fetal revamp. Now, in order to get a fetal revamp, you gotta have a condition here. That is that the bluffs should not be too far because you can, these are the bluffs. Every valley has the bluffs. But the matter is, where are the bluffs? If the bluff is short next to the, the river, then this is very quickly going to get to reach eight feet. But if it's far, like in the Mississippi, the Mississippi is a very broad valley. And the bluffs are there, but they're far. I can't tell you how long because I'm sure it does vary. And I have not been on the Mississippi extensively. I've been there, I don't know, maybe three or four times in different places. I was in Baton Rouge, I was in New Orleans, I was in, in St. Louis. But that doesn't mean I know. In order for me to do that, I have to go back and take a look at the map and figure out where the bluffs are, because the bluffs are there. It's just that the distance, the distance from the river to the bluffs varies. And you guys know really well that the Mississippi River formed its valley through sedimentation. Through sedimentation. We went in there for the last couple hundred years and tried to mess with the river. That's the word, mess with the river, mess with nature. And look what we have done. We, we seem unable to control it. We can't. You cannot control nature because nature has a lot of time, which we don't. But I have 50 years, 60 years of professional life, and those that follow me the same. What is 60 years compared to the life of the Mississippi? Nature, nothing. So whatever she's going to do, she's going to do. And there's nothing we can do to stop it. And that was exemplified very clearly by Mark Fee in his book, the Control of Nature is the book by McPhee that I, if you're interested, I recommend it. I can give you the reference. Actually, I don't have to. McPhee, M-C-P-H-E-E, -E, The Control of Nature, you'll get the, the, uh, the book in no time. It's a great book. It talks about the Mississippi River, the formation, and so forth. So going back here to Kanj, uh, he's talking about the extensive work that Rusinov had done over in the Soviet Union. Okay, and he plots these charts. I do believe these charts are from Rusinov. That is correct. So basically, what we have in here is that he says that the celerity was here. This is the celerity. And then it decreased as, as, as it went over bank completely because it had additional friction in the over bank. The, the depth of the flow became of the same size of the friction, and therefore you, you drop the celerity, right, from 1.7 well, 1.5, all the way, these, these charts are not very good. And then it goes back up when you, when you hit the, the bluffs and you go back up. So these charts are what Rusinov explained by Kanj in his paper. And the reason why Kanj uh, talked about this in his paper is because of the nature of his book. He was talking about practical aspects of computational river hydraulics. And the practical aspects is to route these floods when they go over bank. So he had to come up with the subject. He had to tell us, readers of the book, that the, the pinning down the celerity was going to be, at best, a very difficult proposition. And he was correct. Okay, so that's Kanji's mention of Rusino. And then I'm going to go to my book. This is my book, my uh, open channel book. In chapter 2.2, two, you, many of you have actually seen this already, but it bears repeating for those of you that did not take open channels with me. Uh, this is section chapter 2, section 2, channel geometry. And you, know, you can see the channel can be a meander, and then a meander. How the heck are you going to straighten this out to do it one-dimensional? I don't know how it's done, but it is done. Okay? Uh, because look at that meander. The sinuosity is about one to six. Measured one, the distance from here to here, and six, the measure, the, ratio, the, the length around the circle. It's about, let me see, one, two, three, four, five. It's about six, six to seven, the sinuosity. Typical sinuosities in river vary from 1.5 to, to two, but that's typical. Some rivers have more, like in this one. This is a, a nice meander of the river Umea in Colombia that I had a chance to, um, 
that I had a chance to uh, take a picture. This is my picture. If there's no name in there, there's usually my picture. I have tons of pictures. My collection's about 1,300 pictures that I took over 40 years. Okay, so this is a picture of the Humea River on a meander loop. And over here, this, we have the Huatiquia River in, the, in Colombia, in eastern Colombia, which has not meandered, but is braided. And, and the, formo, the, the for, I would say formo, morphology of rivers is that they're either straight or meandering or braided. And straight when they're young, meandering when they're old, and braided when they carry a lot of sediment. Look at this river. It's braided. It's called braided like with braids, right? And it's because it's carrying a lot of sediment, and the braids are developed by the sediment that has a way to drop out whenever the energy, they lose the energy in a certain location, they drop out the sediment, and then you got a mess of a river in there. In some sense, it's really not a mess, it's a natural river. And there's many braided rivers out there. But as you can see, you cannot consider the hydraulics of a braided river the same as meandering. It's totally different. The braided river carries a lot more sediment, it's a lot wider, a lot wider. Braided rivers typically width to depths 100 to 50 to 100, while meandering is 10 to 40, 10 to 30. Straight may even be less. Usually we don't get rivers less than 10, by the way, width to depth. Mother Nature doesn't like narrow rivers. Really, she really doesn't. If there's a narrow river, it's usually geologically controlled. If it's geologically controlled, then it is not erosion driven or formed by erosion of sand and silt. Okay, a river flood stage overflowing its banks. This is a picture that uh, my friend from Hidro Consulta, Carlos, uh, Carlos Rodriguez, uh, head of Hidro Consulta in, in Bogota, Colombia. They've done a lot of work in hydraulics, the uh, hydraulics firm in Bogota. And they hit a flood over there. You can see there is a flood. Floods that we're talking about here today. But finally, I want to get into this chart, which I, which I put together based on based on the work of Conge and others that have similar, been, done similar work. And we say in here that this is a schematic of a typical variation of flood. Oh, we're already done. Aren't here? Okay, fine. Typical variation of flood wave. Give me a couple minutes here. A flood wave travel with flood stage. So we have in here in bank, okay, stage over here, stage over there, and as the channel increases in depth in bank, the travel time, meaning the re in relation to the celerity, because you have a celerity, you have a distance, you have travel time. I chose to plot the travel time in here. The travel time decreases because more depth, more speed, less travel time. But by the time you get over here, then it reverses and it goes like this. And then by the time you get over here, the, the flood itself, which can go five, six, ten, eight feet. I've seen it here in the U.S. Eight feet of over bank. That's a huge flood, depending on the river, of course, and the bluffs. Then it starts to come down again. It becomes a channel again, a one-dimensional channel again. So this is a chart that would have to be pinned down every time we do a calculation in every place. You're gonna have to come up with some sort of way of figuring out how you pin down this chart. And that is what Kanj was saying that is difficult, difficult to do, difficult to calibrate. But that's what we are being paid for, right, to do these things. So that's basically it as far as I, I've actually exceeded my time over here by one minute. So again, Professor Pond says, uh, if you want to get in touch with me for any reason related to the class, just send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So at this point, I believe there's homework coming up. Right, there's homework coming up. Some of you have already delivered the homework, so I'm going to remind you before 9 o'clock today, those of you that haven't done so, put the homework together and send it to me to my attention before 10 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will see you next uh, Monday.